Okay, now it's time for keynote, keynote number two. Uh, but is it fun? That's the title of it. Uh, and we have uh, first, uh, I think David King will start. He's a technical director uh, of the quality engineering group at DICE here in Stockholm. Mm -hmm. And is responsible for, for software driven testing of the DICE game franchises, most notably the Star Wars, Battlefront, and Battlefield. Uh, once. He's worked in the field of software testing at Electronic Arts for the last uh, nine years. And we also will hear from Magnus Nordin. He's a technical director uh, of the AI group within the SEED R&D team at Electronic Arts. And if I'm not mistaken, SEED stands for the Search for Extraordinary Experiences Division. I like that name, so it takes some time with it. <laughs> Uh, Magnus has spent uh, 25 years doing computer science and software engineering in, uh, in a large number of projects and companies. He's currently heading up the deep learning and AI research team of SEED and Electronic Arts R&D division. Unfortunately, Stefan Postuma uh, uh, cannot come. He's, uh, he's uh, had the flu, I think, or he's back home ill. So David will cover Stefan's part. <laughs> and uh, yes, cool. welcome. just in case I need to do audio. Uh, so I'd like to start off, uh, thank you very much for inviting us here to uh, have a chance to speak to you a day, today about, um, well, something that you'll be familiar with, of course, software testing, but maybe in an industry which you're not uh, um, familiar with and which is, I'd say, a little bit different from most other software industries. So today, I mean, we're going to be talking in effectively three acts. Uh, first of all, I'm going to talk about, you know, what is the video games industry? Well, you know, what do we do? Why are we different? Why are we unique? And then I move along to the meat of the presentation, which is, you know, how do we test, uh, how do we test video game software, uh, both automatically, uh, manually, and, you know, in some of the little bit more esoteric ways. And then I'll be passing over to my colleague, uh, Magni, uh, Magnus, who is going to be talking a little bit more about some of the future deep learning stuff uh, that we're doing uh, with Seed and how we're actually seeing automated testing going in the future. Uh, so to start off with, um, the games industry. Um, what are we and what do we do? Well, let's, uh, hopefully this video will show you a little bit about that. And this is why you need to do sound checks beforehand. <laughs> Just give me a sec. Well, in which case, let me, allow me to just, uh, you know, just narrate this. So this is uh, Battlefield One, our most recent uh, World War One, uh, World War One uh, first-person shooter, up to uh, 64 players uh, playing online at the same time in 32 versus 32 air combat, sea combat, and then something which, uh, you know, a lot more old, uh, or at least a lot more established franchise, The Sims. Uh, simulating life at a very, very basic level. Uh, you know, read a book for four days and suddenly you're a nuclear scientist. Then moving on to Need for Speed, the most recent one, Need for Speed Payback, a story-driven racer with a massive, I believe, a four-by-four-kilometer open world. And then FIFA, uh, the big football, the biggest game in the entire world. We have every single team, every single player from that team, every single person in that from the entire world. Then moving on to Star Wars, our most recent title. Uh, all, of the, all of the heroes, all of the heroes from Star Wars, everyone playing together, fighting together in massive uh, 20 by 20, 40 players simultaneously, um, 40 players simultaneous uh, games. And that was just a highlight of what we have released in the last year. You get more and more of this stuff every year and every two years. So, EA, who are we? Uh, we are one of the largest game publishers uh, in the world, and we have uh, development studios in basically every single continent and quite a large number of companies in the world, including Bioware um, in uh, Canada, Respawn Entertainment in, uh, in the, the US, uh, DICE uh, in Stockholm, just an hour south of here, Criterion Games in Guildford in the UK, uh, Motive in Montreal in Vancouver, EA uh, in uh, Montreal, EA Sports in Vancouver, Mobile and many other uh, locations. We have over 8,500 employees worldwide, and our FY17 revenue was uh, $4.8 billion. But ultimately, games, games are super complex projects. They are developed by hundreds of people. 
Uh, the most recent title that I've been involved with, Star Wars Battlefront 2, had uh, effectively over 1,300 people checking into the source base at any given point, of which there were 400 based in uh, Stockholm and an additional 200 people uh, based in uh, the engine team, which is also in Stockholm. Uh, but you also had several hundred people in, uh, Vancou in uh, Montreal and another few hundred people in Criterion, along with some of the outsourcers and the art and uh, animators and so on and so forth. Um, we have very, very little time to make games. The typical game production cycle is between one to three years, with Star Wars Battlefront being uh, two years. And the schedules are tight. They're really, really tight. We try and pack as much stuff as we can into the development period that we can. And it has to be good because we can't shift. Uh, we can't shift our uh, launch titles. I mean, if we're releasing a Star Wars game, it has to be, of course, tied to the Star Wars movie. And no matter how much we complain to Lucas, they're not going to change the release of their movie if our game's not ready. So we absolutely have to get things right, and we have to get them right on time. And games as they are are massively complicated pieces of software. The Frostbite engine, upon which almost all of Electronic Arts uh, games is based, is over 10 million lines of code by itself. And then the individual games are an additional 10 million lines of code on top of that. And because of the previously mentioned very, very tight and uh, iterative development cycles, we have frequently very little time to actually catch our breath and just say, OK, right, now let's just flatten this out. We're continuously iterating and just doing another one and another one year on year. There are tens of thousands, in fact, at this point, I go to hundreds of thousands and millions of assets that are done across multiple disciplines. You've got 3D models, uh, textures, um, you know, different like, rendering assets, shaders, uh, audio files, uh, text files, voiceover, subtitles, just all of these things. And you've got all of the tools and all of the workflows which are constantly being iterated and constantly being developed alongside of the games to support this. And also, ultimately, game clients are significantly non-deterministic, real-time simulations on multiple multi-threaded architecture. If you think about uh, you know, some of the videos I just showed you, let's just say uh, Battlefield, for example, we're having to simulate millions of particles from explosion effects between 30 to 120 times per second. And if, it, if any of that ever misses or if any of that ever slows down, then our developers are going to know that... Um, <laughs> Uh, then our, then our uh, players are going to see that, and they're just going to feel, oh, something's a bit off there. They will notice, because the human mind is very, very perceptive and see these things. And that's just the client which, um, which runs the game. Uh, games these days are very, very complex live ecosystems. Uh, this, for example, is uh, an example of our entire backend uh, for the Star Wars Battlefront thing, with uh, the names anonymized. But the actual little controller down in the corner, that is just the client. All of the other boxes are things that are related to our marketing systems, our, our achievement systems, how the online system operates, the, the game server, how the game knows what you have unlocked, what, uh, you know, what your progression is. There's a hugely complicated system of just everything uh, which works together to deliver this game experience. And as I mentioned, games have got very, very complex constraints. We're actually in a very, very interesting scenario where uh, our platforms, we both know exactly what the CPU and the GPU and Everything specs are down to, the, uh, down to the hertz. But at the same time, we also have a platform which could be absolutely anything, uh, which is most notably PCs, where some people can have like the latest beefy 32-core 32, uh, 32 Threadripper monstrosity. And then you have someone, and this is an actual true story, who tried to run our latest game on a MacBook that was emulating Windows, which, shockingly, didn't work. But we have to be able to cope with this absolutely massive range and massive uh, complexity of uh, you know, the hardware that people will try and run our games on. But ultimately, the game and the player experience has to be of the highest quality possible. And this is where I think uh, video games are distinct from many, many other pieces of software. If a video game crashes, that isn't inherently a bad thing. I mean, it's not good, but ultimately, what you're trying to make with a video game is fun. And fun is a really, really difficult, and it's a real intangible. If a game crashes, yeah, that's upsetting. But if the game has been made well enough, it is still fun, and people will still play it. Uh, so the gameplay itself needs to be absolutely consistent. Um, but we also have to make sure that things are technically stable enough to allow that fun to get there. So yeah, if, for example, the game not performing well, or the game crashing, doesn't inherently impact, doesn't inherently give fun itself. But if it happens too much, then the game is no longer fun. So it's really, really, it's, a fine balancing act to try and actually you know, make a piece of software that makes this intangible, whilst at the same time not affecting it uh, via the uh, uh, you know, solidity, or at least the, the more quantitative uh, quality of the software as we have previously. 
And uh, if they aren't fun, or if uh, you know, they do break, we will hear about it, and we will hear about it very quickly. Uh, game ha games have absolutely massive user bases. Uh, FIFA, I believe, is, if not the most, is one of the most popular video games in the world, because football is one of the few sports that actually has universal appeal. They had 42 million players just on console in uh, the calendar year of uh, 2017. Battlefield 1, one of our most successful titles that's come out of DICE, has had 25 million unique players uh, to date. So if you know, something will go bad, we will hear about it from a lot of people very, very quickly. We also have a very, very atypical user pattern, whereas instead of, I believe, with typical software, the user will gradually creep up over time, games are very, very immediate hit and then trail off. So on the first weekend, you will have a significant portion of the user base. In fact, with the exception of possibly Christmas, the highest user peak you'll ever get with, uh, at least for FIFA and Battlefield, millions of users in one go. But then that will just you know, gradually uh, tail off into a more consistent pattern. So how do we do for that? So given all of this, uh, you know, this complexity and this uh, difficulty with software, you know, how do we actually test that? And that is what I'm now actually going to talk about in Act 2, how we actually test video games. So, I mean, it probably won't uh, surprise all of you that a video game is just pretty typically like every other uh, piece of software. It is an executable that's built on top of many dependencies and a cascading uh, uh, amount of modules, which gets more and more of a you know, spider web of dependencies as you go on. In fact, Frostbite will have over 200 uh, different modules in uh, any given game, which will range from uh, low-level memory libraries up to uh, high-level functionality. For example, we have a module which defines what it means to be a first-person shooter game. Well, actually, we have several of them. Uh, but they all uh, you know, consume a lot more of the lower-level ones. That's pretty standard. But what is a little bit less typical is the fact that you know, while that is just the nuts and bolts of how things work, for example, uh, a, a user in the world, uh, where, they're, where they're looking at and their transformation, that is done with code. But the vast majority of the logic in the game, for example, going to a door, how does this door open? How does the score increment? How, how does all the internal logic of the game work? That is done by uh, internal custom logic layers, uh, which for EA is uh, in a, or at least for Frostbite, is in something called schematics. Now, most major game engines have got something similar to, li to this, but it is a completely uh, bespoke custom logic layer where, like I said, the vast majority of what the players will actually interface with and how the game works is driven through uh, data flows such as shown here. Now, while this uh, gives us a huge amount of flexibility to create something that's really, really tight and works for uh, video games, uh, that actually makes it very, very difficult to test because we can't take advantage of standard frameworks or standard methodologies for testing this because this is something that runs inside the engine. We actually need the full game to be running at any given point to actually test it, which you know, makes it very difficult to do anything that even approaches a unit test for this. Uh, and also, there is a lot of it. So using this incredibly detailed pie chart that I decided to throw up, um, this is a typical game. This is actually an example of uh, the mo one of the most recent patches for uh, Star Wars Battlefront 2 that we have delivered. While the actual binaries for the game totals about 200 megabytes, we've got about 55 gigabytes of data that is driving the game and just driving all of the experience that users test. Now, whilst the vast majority of that is still going to be things like 3D messages and textures, which are very, very uh, memory intensive, uh, there is a lot of logic there, uh, you know, gigabytes and gigabytes of logic. So um, how do we actually test that? And then you also get on to the final thing of remember, when we're making video games, we are trying to make fun. But one thing you fundamentally cannot do is you cannot unit test for fun. Which makes our lives uh, very, very difficult, and it also means that probably we're never actually going to get humans out of, the, out of the loop when it comes to testing. But you know, fun is something that we can test, but what actually can we test? Well, I'm going to start small, and I'm going to start looking big. First of all, unit testing. So, I mean, I'm not going to uh, patronize this audience by saying what unit testing is. You should all know that. Uh, you all know that. But unit testing is, of course, always the uh, very first step in what we, uh, what we do. Uh, first of all, it's, of course, you know, very easy to understand. It's had years, it's had decades of work by uh, audiences such as this, um, which actually allow us to, you know, test all of the low-level libraries and test them actually, you know, reasonably well. Uh, the problem is, and I'd say is probably a little bit more of a systematic one of the games industry, is the games industry has grown over time, and it's been running at a really, really fast pace uh, for quite a lot of that time. And it's sometimes been difficult to actually stop and catch our breath and go back and just think, right, we've got these 10 million, li 10 million lines of code. Where do you start unit testing that? 
And that's uh, you know, sometimes quite difficult. It's definitely something that we're working on, and we generally start of, OK, create a baseline. This is the coverage that we've got, and always try and increase uh, what we have there. But it's something that we're definitely going to be uh, improving on. Also, given the spider web, as I mentioned, of previous dependencies, sometimes it can be uh, difficult to integrate it into some of the modules. Now, that is something which we're actually now starting to take a lot more seriously and are actively, uh, ac actively trying to um, you know, re-architect some of these modules to actually make them more testable, start adhering to solid principles, uh, dependency injection, and so on and so forth. And as I mentioned previously, timelines will can and do make that difficult, but it is something that we're actively investing in given that we've seen uh, the benefits that unit testing can come in. Uh, but then moving on to the, uh, you know, a lot more interesting stuff, actually, you know, testing the game, uh, this is when we start thinking about runtime integration testing. Now, this is kind of taking the principle of unit testing, but extending it to our, uh, to our custom logic layers. So what we'll do is we will create you know, custom levels which are only just testing that feature. Uh, so for example, here, this is an example of the uh, weapons uh, for Star Wars Battlefront 2. We created an entirely isolated level so we could get rid of as many dependencies as we possibly could. And then each of those little models there is uh, an isolated unit test, as you uh, could probably call, uh, for game logic to test that that gun actually you know, fires, is usable, is actually creating an output in the rate that we'd need. Um, we actually managed to use these tests to find Things, uh, to find an example where the guns were actually creating an incorrect amount of damage on vehicles. So one person could just come with basically their pea shooter, they'd shoot a, an X-wing and the thing would explode in a, a shower of those million particle effects that we uh, talked earlier. So this stuff is actually very, very useful and is run frequently on every single check-in. Uh, in this case, is whenever the weapons team changes anything. Now, uh, the plus side of this is because it's done in the same tools and it's done in the same data and workflows that our content creators use, um, it fits into the workflows entirely. We don't have to teach content creators, uh, many of whom uh, have absolutely no programming background whatsoever, uh, you know, how to code and how to actually start coding unit tests. They fundamentally understand how this logical flow works because it's what they use on a day-to-day -day basis. And it also allows us to do isolated environments so that we, you know, uh, don't have, try and minimize the problems with non-determinism and cross-dependency of the data. Now, unfortunately, the downside of this is that it's a lot slower than a typical unit test because we effectively have to boot the entire game, which is a uh, much slower process than uh, scaffolding some basic code, for example. But it does allow us to get a reasonable amount of iteration and coverage on game data that is being changed. We can also do a lot more interesting stuff than just... Uh, uh, you know, than just uh, game logic testing. We can also start testing some of the engine features, such as rendering. Uh, this is a good example of some of the rendering tests that we have. Uh, now, the top two images, one of them is a reference image, and one of them is uh, uh, an image that was done as part of the test on left and right. Now, a human can't see the difference in them, but luckily enough, the... Uh, Luckily enough, the test can, and at the bottom left, it can produce a heat map of what the difference between the pixels in the uh, two different images is, and then produce a heat, and then produce a heat map of uh, what was too bad, what is too much of a change, and what is breaking this reference image down there. So this is actually a failed test case, but this is something, and this is an example of how a full unit test can also be applied, a uh, full uh, engine unit test can be applied to the, uh, to the smaller or the uh, lesser game. And these are ones that are run by the Frostbite engine team and the Frostbite rendering team uh, on, I believe, the vast majority of check-ins they do. Then moving on, a little bit more of the meat of it is the end-to-end -end testing of the game. So we have, we have actually since Battlefield 1 and including in Battlefield 2, we've managed to script in-game data a full playthrough of the uh, single-player game. Um, this, this allows us to basically say, if a user was to come in play the game and play it from end to end, which can be anything from five to 10 hours worth of, uh, 10 hours worth of gameplay, what would their experience be? What sort of asserts would they see? What sort of crashes would they see? Uh, where does the game logic not work? I mean, if I'm walking up to a door and that door doesn't open and you know, the whole of the rest of the game is on the other side, how do I get there? Well, so what we've done is we worked with the um, we worked with this single player, or at least the campaign team. And as they are developing the level, they also develop the uh, they also input the track for testing alongside the alongside the regular game. This includes some things like you know aiming at enemies, make sure they die if they're not all dead within X amount of time. We just kill them and then carry on. But it is a very very accurate simulation of what a uh, user would be seeing as they're playing through the game. And then on a uh, daily basis, we can produce uh, an output showing you know, what the game is, what was the build, what was the playability, how many times did we need to restart. 
Uh, what new issues have we seen uh, in this? Um, what new issues have we seen in this run through? What asserts have been fired? What crashes came in and haven't been previously reported? And if they haven't been previously reported, how do we report them? We then immediately link through and can, we can create uh, bugs in our defect tracking system, which immediately link back to the videos and the playthrough information of the game, all of the debug information that the person would need. And then also for known issues, just this has been seen again, and these are the issues that are currently been tracked. Uh, and a good example in this one would be uh, the one close to the bottom where it said, oh, that issue's actually been closed and fixed. Uh, well, that's not, no, that's not necessarily the case because we've just seen it again. We can then reopen that issue and make sure it's actually fixed correctly. And ultimately, um, we run this on every single platform every single day, which has taken basically what is days worth of human testing down to less than four hours with a robot. Uh, which, and we could probably speed that up even further by doing things like uncapping the frame rate, because at the minute the logic runs at either 30 or 60 hertz, depending on the title. If you uncap that, it basically just runs as fast as the computer can do. So we could probably get that down to one, possibly two hours. But you know, that's just testing individual things. That's just you know doing unit te uh, you know, te testing small things, testing single player things. How do we actually start testing at scale? How do we you know? Get, get all of these tests running with hundreds of developers uh, you know, constantly checking in. We get a check-in at a rate of, I think, about once every five minutes. Um, and you know, full test suites for the entire game would take absolutely hours to run. So how do we actually do that? Well, um, we got this, which is uh, my baby, it's my pride of joy. Uh, this is our auto test farm. Uh, so we have uh, 75 PS4s, 75 Xbox Ones, and 75 PCs uh, in here, which are constantly churning through the game and churning through all the tests as fast as we possibly can. This is supporting uh, check-ins, uh, testing as part of pre-flight, so before something even gets checked in, supporting as part of the build system and supporting uh, regular soaks and regular smoke tests. Uh, the build system in the background will automatically be creating a build, deploying it to the machines, and running it as quickly uh, as it can. And as much as I am proud of this, I don't think it's big enough, and I've just put in a request to double it. Um, managing hardware at this scale is not easy, but it is very, very rewarding in what you can do. Um, just basically because the quality, or at least the stability of the code base on which the developers are working has just gone from strength to strength. Uh, in the case of the actual code base being unusable, at any given point is now basically non-existent in a typical development space. But you know, that's just a few machines. That's just allowing us to test you know, as a studio, as a scale. How do we actually test Epic Multiplayer? Because uh, as I mentioned, DICE is, a, DICE is a studio which is known for its Epic Multiplayer games. Uh, 64 players in a server, all firing machine guns, grenades, driving tanks, flying, uh, flying whatever vehicles at any given point uh, at very, very high frequency. How do we actually test that? You know, the, the problem is that you know, 64 players, it sounds cool. We don't have 64 QA on the project. Uh, hell, I mean, it's, it's very difficult to even get 64 developers together to play the game. But, ha but we need to test max players, so how do we actually do that? Uh, now, luckily enough, uh, you know, because it's in the game and because we have access to all the game logic, we can just bolt a nice little, um, a nice little blue layer which will be simulating users onto the side of the game logic layer. And these generally come in uh, three different flavors. You can either have a pad monkey, which is just something that mindlessly just presses inputs and just spin in circles and throw grenades at their feet, which is a massive problem until we did dis disable their ability to use grenades. Uh, <laughs> Very, very easy to implement, but the problem is it's not realistic. I mean, it's a great way of getting a real person's uh, kill ratio up because, you know, if someone's just sitting there, standing there doing that, it's very, very easy to hit them. But it's not really a representative test. It's not going to find what users actually do. So we then moved on to heuristic pad monkeys, which is uh, effectively, you know, mashing buttons again, but with a little bit more contextual awareness of what's going on. So, for example, it will use the movement buttons and the directional buttons a lot more than it will use the shoot buttons or the grenade buttons. It will also, uh, you know, not aim uh, below or above a certain uh, a certain threshold, and this gives us, you know, still relatively stupid bots, but at least a lot more reasonable uh, facsimile of what a user will do. And depending on how you tune it, you can either give it um, somewhere between 50 to 200% of the server traffic that a normal user would do. Now, this is good for a, a number of scenarios. If you manage to get it to 100, then if you're, if you're testing network simulation, that is a very, very good test. If you're wanting to seriously stress test the network, you can put it up to 200%. However, that's just you know, testing the, uh, how the internals and how the runtime works. There's still not a real and representative test of uh, you know, how an actual user would use the game. 
at which point we're now moving on to scriptable, uh, scriptable bots. This is um, bots where we can actually script the behavior using schematics in exactly the same way that we would do for uh, you know, for the game logic. So again, this is something that the content creators can use, but we can also start driving a lot more intelligent behaviors. A uh, good example being uh, there is a game mode where you need to go to a point and you need to capture that. We're now able to actually script if you are in a squad and you have a certain amount of backup, go there, capture this location, stay there until you have captured it and shoot any enemies that you see which gives us significantly more realistic uh, bots that are playing the game and actually things that you can put in with humans. And although we're not quite at a human realistic levels yet, uh, you know, it would still be a bit of a challenge to actually work with them. Uh, you know, the benefits of this, again, much more realistic, but it's also a little bit more time consuming to implement, but it's also very beneficial for the team. So that's how we test it, but you know, how do we actually, that would allow us to do like a small 64 player test uh, you know, with all of the machines that we have in the farm, but that would break everything else up. So we need to then get a little bit more intelligent about how we actually test 64 clients. So as I showed previously, you've got the, uh, you've got the game logic here, which is generally divided into uh, the game logic and the rendering layer. Well, the other solution is to just strip the rendering layer off. If we're testing multiplayer, we don't need to actually render the game 64 times, maybe once so that we can actually see what's going on. Uh, but you know, not multiple times, because rendering is the most expensive part of the entire game by a massive amount. So once you've stripped that off, uh, you can start being um, you know, a lot more sensible. You can actually just have, um, you can start running multiple clients next to each other on the same machine, uh, thin or headless clients, depending on how you want to call them, and they all connect to one server, and then you've immediately reduced the amount of hardware you need to run the game from 64 machines down to, let's say, eight, uh, for example, because uh, there's still quite a lot of data in the game logic. However, I think we can still do better than that. What if, considering that, um, considering that the uh, gameplay logic, or at least the, uh, the bots that are on it, are still effectively just uh, ser server-side configurations or server-side behaviors, we could just actually completely remove uh, most of the clients and just put most of the logic on the server-side. At which point then, when you have a, uh, you know, basically a bit more of a beefy server running and calculating it, all you need is one client connected. Because ultimately, if you're testing network bandwidth, if you're testing stability, you only need one client, and only that client just needs to see what everything else is. Because our games are client-server, they're not peer-to-peer. -peer. So as far as that client is concerned, everyone else is connected. It doesn't actually need to know that the server is uh, hiding the uh, difficulties of the abstraction there. Um, so this actually, uh, because we're not using uh, GPUs, because we're not using rendering, and because we're all using basically scalable elastic uh, hardware, this allows us to be a much more efficient with the hardware that we use, but also it also allows us to go and start testing in the cloud, which is uh, a massive win for us, given the, as I mentioned, massive multiplayer game with, 25, with uh, you know, two to five million players in the first weekend, you need to have a scalable elastic infrastructure to be able to test that in a realistic way. So moving on, uh, back-end testing. Uh, this is actually uh, a lot more simple uh, because um, the, quite a lot of the back-end systems and all of the architecture that's in there is a lot more traditional software. There's no rendering layer that it has to do. Most of the code, dri code drives all of the logic. There's very, very uh, little data layer there. And uh, all of the services are atomized as microservices. So these can broadly be tested in very, very typical ways that you would you know, test, uh, test an environment. You just, yeah, you know. Set up a fake environment, uh, you know, uh, prop, uh, prop some um, in injected, uh, prop some simulated interface and test things uh, in isolation using standard frameworks. So I won't go into this too much, but I mean, suffice to say with, the, with all the backend systems, whenever there's a check-in, there's an automated process of building uh, performance and load testing in isolation before something is immediately promoted uh, to the development environment. Uh, we do actually have benchmark, also have uh, benchmarking and load testing for these systems, which have allowed us to identify some really, really nasty bottlenecks um, in some of the back-end systems that we've had. For example, if anyone's played Star Wars Battlefront 2, uh, they'll be aware that uh, the progression in the game is done by unlocking uh, cards uh, in the game. Now, we generally use between three to five cards per uh, unlock session, but there was an initial design which had 10. But then we discovered that the, because each of those card unlocks was actually a marketplace transaction, um, that that actually caused an insurmountable block in the back end, so we had to make the cards more powerful and deliver less of them. And because we had this load testing, and it's something that we hadn't had before, uh, allowed us to eliminate that problem very, very early. But, yeah, I mean, if I'm going to loop back to, you know, what this presentation is about, you know, is it fun? I mean, I've been talking about, you know, how we actually test the technical aspects of the game and how, uh, of the data. 
I haven't actually touched on the thrust of this. It's like, yeah, okay, that all works, you know, but is it fun? And as I, rem as I remind you, fun cannot be unit tested. The game not performing is not fun, but again, performance is not good in and of itself. Games are largely open environments where the main interactions, especially in multiplayer, with the other players is part of the key parts of this. So there's, you know, ultimately, there's a limit to how realistic we can make it. Humans, at least for now, uh, are required to test fun. So we need to try and get as much quantitative stuff as possible tested automatically, which is now allowing our QA to do the quality testing. And that's where we move on to our quality analysts. So our quality analysts are uh, QA who are embedded with the team. And there's a bit of a nasty impression in the games industry that quality analysts, or at least QA for games, are just you know, kids off the street who just come in and play games. And, you know, come in and play games and say, yeah, you need to improve the graphics on level four. Um, while that may have been the case 20 years ago, uh, it is definitely not the case anymore. Uh, our analysts are highly motivated and highly skilled. Uh, they are directly embedded within the uh, game teams, uh, learning and constantly communicating design changes, because that's another thing. The design of a game will change a lot during the two years that it's being developed, even up to weeks before launch. Um, they also support critical development processes. So these are things like um, we have a couple of branches. They support the uh, push between branches uh, into different stability levels. They make sure that these things can be turned around and are highly effective. Uh, and also, uh, they have actually started delivering training uh, to developers with regards to what quality means. How do you design something to be testable? How can you make something so it can be testable so that QA can test exactly what you want to see there? And actually, in many ways, because you know, every single game we make is new, every single game we make is unique and has new things, they're also developing new ways of testing. So this is a uh, good example from one of our uh, analysts, um, one of our analysts on the team, who was uh, testing netcode. Or also testing the player feel. Now, how do you know between when you click when the shot will show up on someone else's machine? Or you know, how, how do you know what the sort of like response time is for that? Now, of course, you could you know do a unit test that you know checks it. But if you're checking quality, you need to know the feel of it. Does it feel like there's a lag between when I click and actually the gun starts firing? So as part of that, she actually developed this new area where she's now using high-speed uh, GoPro cameras. This actually showed a regular rate, but it's being filmed at 240 frames per second. At which point, uh, let's see if I can play that again. You might be able to see a small light just below the screen. So that light has been wired directly into the mouse so that we get a complete visual impulse of when the click has actually happened. And then you can track the amount of frames that, until you see it on the screen. Now, this allows us to test many, many little things. Um, you know, just basically also the, like, the latency between things. You can also do this with multiple machines with network simulation in the middle. But it also allows you to start testing the feel of the game. If anyone's uh, familiar with the concept of the uncanny valley, uh, the uncanny valley is as simulations of people get more and more realistic. They become more appealing to a person. Up until they're almost realistic, at which point they become eerie and the attraction to humans goes down significantly until it climbs way back up until you can't actually tell the difference. Now, we're well into that state with video games and part of you know, what makes a game fun is the feel of how realistic it is. So if there's a, a death animation, for example, a player gets shot and you know, they fall down holding their gun, if that gun doesn't track with the hands, the models are out of sync, that feels weird, but it's not something you can actually really see with the mind. It, it feels bad. However, using this process of high-speed video, you can actually play back areas which have just seemed a bit off, which allow us to capture the feedback for that, which we can then go to the team and say, look, you need to improve that here, and broadly improve the feel. And this is, um, this is a developing area we've only had for the last two games, but it's already um, the, this one quality analyst who's been here for this, is now completely overworked. So all of the teams are going, oh, I, I need to know how my area feels. I need to know if my area is fun. It's really, really interesting stuff. And then, you know, there's also only so much that, uh, you know, QA can do. Ultimately, developers need to know what they are making is fun. Uh, as such, we will have uh, play tests. And the play tests are really like the first mass tests of fun. They'll be run uh, daily in the studio. There'll be different levels or different game modes to focus just to keep things fresh, make sure you're not testing the same thing every day. Uh, generally, whatever's being iterated on uh, at any given point. And you know, people actually play the game as like, is this a game I want to play? Is this a game I would actually, I'm actually happy with? What do I like? What do I not like? Uh, there's a culture of being very, very open about feedback. If you don't like something, you say it. If you like something, you say it. 
All of that stuff is collated at the end and is used to continuously update and iterate the design as it goes on. Because, you know, as I mentioned, the game design will change a lot as it goes on. Because as much as you can't test fun, you also can't plan fun. You can plan what you think fun is, but it's important to iterate upon that if you don't know. And we've got a bunch of custom tools that we use to organize this, a thing called Playtest Mate, which single click person just subscribes to a playtest, and then when it's time, launch the game, and they can just play it. It makes it as easy as possible for people to join in on and easy as possible to run. But there's also, you know, as much as we've got the high-quality embedded analysts and all of the other playtests, the games still have a lot to test, an absolutely huge amount and growing content every single time. And as such, we also do need to rely on mass QA testing. Uh, we have dozens of QA in specialized locations, and they just test everything manually. Uh, they also do regression testing, and they also do complex stability and long-term testing. Uh, this is just basically a thousands and thousands of hours of test cases that are just generally run and regressed on builds that come through on a roughly daily basis. So that's pretty typical. However, it doesn't matter how much testing we do internally, we are never, ever, ever going to get as much testing as our users will provide. So uh, as such, you know, testing never doesn't stop when we deliver the product. In fact, if anything, uh, that's the beginning of the, you know, uh, of the real testing. As I mentioned, 1,200 developers, several hundred QA, millions of players. So we uh, focus on, you know, do quite a lot of testing with our community through alpha, uh, open beta, and community test, and actually in live. Uh, closed alpha is generally the first pass, it is generally invite, very small scale, a uh, few thousand users simultaneously, uh, generally focusing on technical testing, gameplay testing, and tuning. To give us an early indication of what we think the stability of the game is going to be like, what things people like, what's fun, what's not, and what areas we need to focus on for the actual live launch of the game. Also use it to validate just the core gameplay loops for fun. Moving on from that, we have the community test environments. Now, this is a, a new, uh, new, new situation. It's, it's an opt-in environment for live, uh, where people can just you know, come and say, I wish to join this. Generally at a medium scale, so tens of thousands of users at the same time. We use this for balance testing. We use this to get community feedback. We use this to test new features that we may actually not be you know, completely certain about. What do you like about this? What do you not like about this? kind of gives people an opportunity to see what's coming and get some feedback from the uh, community about that. Also allows us to test some really interesting stability fixes. For example, if we're changing how the network code works, we'll generally put it into a CTE first uh, to actually make sure that it hasn't had a detrimental experience. And CTE is actually uh, uh, immensely valuable. Uh, we generally get between uh, 500 to 3,000 users at any given point with uh, tens of thousands of users every single day and hundreds of thousands of test hours during the very, very small amount of time that it's been played. Uh, in fact, overall, um, with the CTE, we've had the equivalent of and just shy of 170 years of testing at a standard uh, QA complement of 70. Uh, we've had absolutely zero critical failures on this, even though these builds are technically rushed out uh, quite fast because you know, it's a small test. We can't spend a, the huge amount we would do on a regular build on this. But we've managed to do 50, uh, 50 releases at seven and a month with zero failures, and that's given us 170 hours of highly valuable testing. So expect to see more of this uh, in the future. And then finally, the last major open test is the open beta. Uh, these are free and open to everyone, and this is where people try and play on their MacBooks with emulated Windows. <laughs> But it does give us an actually really, really good cross-section uh, of our community. It is a massive scale, and we're talking millions of players simultaneously playing the game. And it allows us to test everything, the entire infrastructure, all of the systems, all of the back end, all of the failure. We also do this thing called uh, break the beta, where we actually deliberately introduce bad uh, network conditions or bad simulations to actually test the darkest day uh, you know, of what would be happening on launch. It also allows us to see you know, what actually the major issues are, uh, seeing our players, so that we can actually uh, prioritize which things we'll be fixing for the patches. Any final tuning that needs to happen, and also any tuning that would happen for the community sentiment feeling the game. Because the beta is generally a few weeks before launch, so there's not a huge amount of time to change anything before that. But betas are planned out well in advance. We, uh, you know, we direct the opportunity, and we give everyone uh, the... Oh, yeah the opportunity to see how far they would go with this and you know, guide the experience through that. And uh, that allows us to also you know, focus the uh, back end on that. And then finally, live, we've got a, this is a picture of our war room for Battlefront 2. It's where we're just showing, you know, monitoring everything as it's going on, monitoring all the systems, getting immediate alerts if anything goes wrong so that we can fix it basically immediately. Ultimately, 99% of bugs that are released, we will know about, but they've just been determined to not impact fun, so we will launch the game. 
And that is finally how we test. So in summary, um, the way games are made makes it difficult but not impossible to test in, uh, automatically. There is a lot to test, but we've got to be selective about it. Stability is not a core part of fun. Uh, it is a core part of fun, but it's not the only part, and it's, never well, it's not possible to get the human element out of testing, and it's difficult to simulate, uh, test, simulate humans accurately. But on that note, allow me to turn you over to Magnus, who will be talking a little bit more about the future of testing. Yes. <coughs> is my mic on? Yeah. Uh, okay, so I'm a uh, uh, technical director of SEED, uh, an R&D organization within Electronic Arts, and we do a lot of rendering research, animation research, but also some AI and machine learning uh, stuff. So one of the projects we thought we could look into helping the game teams was using reinforcement learning to uh, uh, do automatic testing, because as you have seen from David here, it's hard to do, especially the big game mode, 64 players, and it's uh, hard and a lot of work to do good bots to actually test the games. So what is reinforcement learning? <coughs> oh, okay, this one has automated timings on. Uh, it, uh, how do I stop this? Uh, Slideshow from... No, I think it's... No, sorry. It's still this. Okay, now I can actually control the slides. <laughs> uh, so reinforcement learning. We have an agent acting in an environment, and uh, the agent can perform actions in that environment, uh, and it gets observations, what happened when I did this action. We also have rewards and penalties. We, we have uh, something we want to achieve, a goal. And reinforcement learning has been around for a long time. Uh, it's mostly been in uh, uh, solving toy problems, though, until uh, a couple of years ago when we combined reinforcement learning with some neural networks. Uh, and uh, we call this deep reinforcement learning. And here's a, a small exam example. Uh, of what reinforcement learning is. So the blue, this is a super simple game, the simplest possible game. <clears throat> so the blue guy here is the player. Uh, the goal is to eat the green dots, avoid the red ones, they are poison pills. And <clears throat> when we start out here, the, the blue guy, he doesn't know anything, he's just doing random stuff. Uh, it's, uh, it's hitting both red and green, and as you can see, the score is going down. Uh, so it's not going well, but of course it's completely newly born and essentially blind. Um, after a few minutes, we see this behavior. So now you can see it's trying to hide in a corner, uh, <laughs> going out to eat some greens, da dashing out bravely. And, uh, and then after a few hours, it looks like this. <clears throat> so now it's, it's playing this game in a superhuman fashion. There's no way you can play this game uh, as good as this little uh, agent. So reinforcement lear learning works for, for these very simple games. <clears throat> uh, and, and one thing I should note here, the observation that it gets, it does ray casting around it, so it has kind of a small radar, that's how it sees the world. Uh, but then, a couple of years ago, um, Google DeepMind started playing these old Atari games using only a visual observation. So the only input here is the pixels and the score of the game. And uh, they showed that it was possible using reinforcement learning to actually play these games. Uh, there's 57 different games in this set, and it can play almost all of them in today in a, in a superhuman uh, fashion. Some of the games that require more planning uh, is still hard, but most of the games work. Uh, and this is, of course, this was a huge step forward for reinforcement learning. So <clears throat> then we started thinking, can we do this for our games? So this is, of course, our games is much more complicated. A lot has happened in 40 years. Uh, but we started um, testing. So these are some pictures from early experiments. And every little guy here is uh, controlled by a neural network, trained by reinforcement learning. So the objective for this little squad is to hold the road between the walls here. The guy to the north is uh, in the opposing team, and let's see what happens. <laughs> yeah, 
not, not great. So what happened here, of course, this was early. They were really stupid first, but they also they only have vision. Uh, they don't have hearing. So this is an example of the vision they have. They have a low resolution image of the world. That's what they act on. Uh, so we just slapped on this little small radar, a 2D radar on top of the 3D view that uh, imitates hearing. It's a short range 20 meter radar where you can hear footsteps and gunshots and other things. And the great thing with neural networks and deep learning is that the agents immediately picked up this radar. We didn't do any changes to the code. They just learned how to use the radar and uh, they were not ambushed anymore. So let's look at an example, another small game we built uh, because we couldn't jump directly into battlefield. So in this case, we have this little green guy uh, is the agent. And uh, it has a lot of actions it can do, move and turn and uh, shoot and aim and, and do uh, a lot of stuff. The objective here is to protect these blue tinted areas. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll get an explanation. <clears throat> so the blue is what it's supposed to protect, find and protect, I should say, because the blue area moves around. Uh, health, it can pick up health and ammunition, uh, lying around on the ground, and we have a lot of red bots that uh, are, well, classical uh, AI bots. Uh, so this is what the agent sees, the low resolution view. Uh, and we can also see the small, uh, small radar. The blue dot indicates the direction to the goal. Uh, so we can see that it has learned to play the game. Uh, it uh, picks up boxes, it moves towards the blue area over there. And one thing that surprised us a bit was that usually in games you have a lot of navigation systems for the AI, like nav meshes and other uh, things. There is no navigation system at all in this. Uh, and the bot has still learned to navigate uh, this uh, environment and find, find objective and um, also developed all these little um, uh, behaviors like uh, patrolling and defending and searching and a lot of stuff came out of this uh, pretty simple neural network actually. But it, it does take quite a long time to train this uh, agent. So I'm a bit short on time, so I'll skip a bit. Uh, so these agents are also very good at generalization. So this is exactly the same agent. We just dropped it into this very simple car game. Of course, the action space changes. It can no longer shoot. And of course, the reward changes. It's now going forward instead of protecting an objective. But in just a few minutes, the same agents learned to, um, to play this game, just from vision only. So they are very uh, general. So if we look into AAA games, like Battlefield. So we did this experiment, <coughs> actually applying this to Battlefield. And uh, let's see uh, the results. So when doing this, we actually first started with just a rendered camera view of, uh, of the Battlefield game just like we did in that small experiment I showed you earlier. But the, the visual environment of Battlefield is too complex. There, there is, it's too realistic. So we, we had to spend all our time on computer vision, which was not our uh, goal. So we, we implemented a, s a simplified observation. So you can see the blue things. It's still a first-person view, but it's very low resolution. The blue stuff is obstacle. The, gr the red stuff is enemies. And we still have a small hearing. It's still just 20 meters, uh, a small hearing radar. And of course, the rewards, we use the score of the game. That's what the agents are trying to optimize to achieve. Uh, we also have a few more, because we don't have the full, all the actions of the game implemented. They can't actually resupply or get help from another partner to heal and other things. So we still have the boxes of supplies. And uh, we also have, um, like from the previous experiment, we implemented a waypoint so the teams actually want to go somewhere to meet each other. And another thing, uh, we train these, uh, and another difference in Battlefield, we actually have the full teams, not just one single agent. So we have full teams uh, battling each other. And we train this by self-play. That is, they learn to play against each other. And uh, one thing we noticed that we have to freeze one of the team's brains, because when they were exactly the same, uh, something happened, and this will be a bit awkward without sound, but you will recognize the scene, at least. Um, so this is from 83, War Games, and this is Whopper or Joshua uh, trying to decide who will win the nuclear war by doing a lot of simulation and learning. And there's lots of dramatic music here, of course. And, um,
and then it suddenly stops and uh, have come up with a conclusion. A strange game, the only winning move is not to play. And that's exactly what happened with our bots in Battlefield. If they had exactly the same brain, when both teams had the same brain, they of course became pacifist. If I don't learn to shoot, I don't get shot. So they, they went... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So they, they went around uh, collecting boxes, and uh, this was, of course, very uh, uh, nice of the bots, but it, it didn't test the game. Uh, so we actually had to incite some violence by putting... Uh, uh, we, we put a few of the, the, the simple AI bots, we, we mixed in a few of those in the team, so they actually started shooting, and then they had to defend themselves. Uh, I know it, it sounds bad, but uh, we, we need to test. It's, it's, uh, it's a first-person shooter game, so we have to do it. Uh, so does it work? So once again, these videos are better with sound, but uh, I'll, I'll talk a bit over it. Uh, yeah, well, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, <laughs> so this, uh, they, they are alive and doing something, but it, it's, uh, it's not great uh, Battlefield gameplay. <coughs> <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, so this happens sometimes when they're not sure what to do. They're also not great inside of houses, so we can look at what happens here. Uh, so we see this um, circle. They get stuck and get circling. Uh, but these are exceptions. Uh, most of the time, actually, um, uh, it does work. So all you see here, every, every player in this scenario is a neural network controlled by an agent that has learned to play the game itself. There's not a single line of code defining the behavior of these players. Of course, there's a huge learning system underneath to help them learn, but uh, it's only a neural network. That's the only thing influencing their actions. And uh, this was hard. It took six days on a lot of machines to actually train these agents. and. Uh, uh, it's still an experiment, it's just the beginning, but we think we can actually uh, do this, not just for Battlefield, uh, this game, uh, we can probably do it for car games and for FIFA, like we saw playing football using these ag agents, would be really interesting. Uh, and uh, uh, So this kind of proof of concept uh, has shown that, uh, yes, we can probably use deep reinforcement learning to uh, to test our games. And of course, the end goal is, of course, to use this as AI in our games as well. But right now, our goal, first milestone, is to, they should be good enough to, to actually exercise the game to test it. But uh, it will be a few more years before we actually dare put something like this into the game and meeting players. But yeah. And uh, was this the last uh, slide? Yeah. Cool, thanks, Magnus. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, just uh, as a summary, uh, the games industry, very, very fun, but it's an industry with very, very unique challenges. Um, it is often difficult to follow uh, standard software testing patterns, uh, but we are improving. We're constantly improving. We're constantly making what we develop and what we do uh, more testable. Uh, we're using increasing automated uh, testing to actually get there. We're using increasing intelligent automation to get there. But unfortunately, we're never going to get uh, humans out of the loop. Uh, that is until we can unit test fun, which, to be honest, um, Magnus' work is absolutely fantastic, and it has come on so quickly. Um, I would be very surprised if I don't see that at some point in my life. And with that, uh, thank you for listening. Uh, do we have time for questions? Yes, we do. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Okay, great. Thanks uh, so much for this. It's great fun. Uh, uh, I hope you excuse us for taking some time for question, even though we should have coffee now. Let's do this. Andy. Uh, that was really great. Uh, and I'm not even a game player. <laughs> uh, but I, I want to see if I, I got the right message <laughs> from your, your talk. So this is my uh, summary of what, what you said. So basically, the difference between traditional testing and what you're doing is that you have to do a lot of simulation to make the, the test realistic enough to, to test all the functionality. 
And at some point, even the simulation is not good enough. And so you have to sort of transition from simulation to a field testing environment with lots and lots of users. Uh, so am I on, on track? Uh, yes, so that's far? completely right. I mean, as much, I mean, we can simulate and we can, uh, we can you know, scaffold just so much stuff. But you know, ultimately, what we're not trying to produce is input defini defined output. What we're trying to produce is sentiment. And until someone comes up with a way of testing for that, uh, we're going to have to go to large scale real user testing. And the, the, other, the other takeaway I got is that although there's a lot of things going on visually in a game, they don't all matter to uh, whether people like to play it because um, every dimension of the picture is not equally important. Uh, so you, you're trying to focus on figuring out what matters to the users uh, to keep them happy. So if, they, if there are certain things going on that you know, don't meet the specifications, but they don't even see it or, or care about it, that's OK with you. Is that right? Uh, yes, that is absolutely correct. Uh, so I mean, as you rightly call out, there are just so many factors in you know, making a game, audio, visual, story, uh, gameplay, stability. If we focus on as many of those areas as possible, we can you know, give ourselves as many chances as we possibly can to get that end goal of really, really good sentiment. <laughs> But you're completely right. Some areas, you know, some areas won't matter to some people, and they will be, com you know, completely all over the place. If you actually look at some of the most popular games over the last year, you know, quite a lot of them actually have some really, really glaring flaws in areas. But that doesn't matter because the other areas are spectacular, and they've managed to generate fun. Okay. So my final question is: Now that I think I understand what you're doing, yeah. what can we do for you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you asked that. Um, I was actually umming and ahhing as to whether to say as part of this, you know, this is why we need you guys, this is why we need you to help us uh, you know, make our software better. Um, I think what we really, really need is some of the challenges I mentioned about actually testing the areas that we do without scaffolding. We need more automated ways to be able to do that. We need more reinforced uh, you know, bots to actually take the stuff that we're currently using, all of our human input to uh, test, which ultimately should be automated, so that our actual human, um, you know, the human con contributors to game development can then actually focus on that end goal of the sentiment. You know, just take all, all of the easily, what should theory be easily automatable stuff away from them so that they can focus on I mean, ultimately, why most of us got into the games industry to play games. Yeah, we have Elaine up there was first. So, well, first of all, you might notice that I look a lot different than 95% of the people in this room. And my confession is I've never in my life played a video game <laughs> and nothing would ever make it fun for me. But, <laughs> I mean, you know, um, so I have a lot of experience with uh, load testing of very large systems, and I'm sort of interested in the technical question. One of the things, so in the telephony arena, uh, one of the things that killed us, or the biggest kinds of problems that we would get would be some kind of resource leakage that caused problems that tended not to be reproducible and tended to you know, not happen in predictable ways. Is that an issue that you face? Uh, yes, it is. And we generally tackle it in um, either one of uh, two ways. Uh, so first of all, um, we have like proper, mo as I'm sure you do, we have a monitoring of all of our systems and all of our back ends uh, for you know, signs of a memory leak. And at which point, uh, as and when that happens, we will uh, take a full uh, memory dump of that, which we can then send back to our engineers to be able to diagnose. And I believe in most scenarios, that actually does help. Uh, the other way, but that's a sort of like a reactive way of testing it. One of the more uh, proactive ways that we, uh, we work with this is uh, we make our systems uh, fault tolerant and redundant. 
Uh, so, you know, that, that graph I showed you of all of our backend systems, I mean, those are, of course, you know, abstractions. There will be multiple, multiple instances spread across many, many nodes that will be able to do that. Uh, as and when we notice that one has actually got into that bad state, we'll automatically kill it, and then the load balancing will take over in the back end. So the actual end effect to the users uh, is negligible, if anything. We'll then use that in, you know, uh, collaboration with trying to actually work out what was happening there, uh, and inputs and logs and so on and so forth to try and tackle it. And I believe that that uh, tackles most of the scenarios, but unfortunately that's a little bit outside of my area. Uh, I'm more focused on the game client, but yeah. Okay, well, thank you. I, I'm just wondering, one of the things that we found, so uh, we had massive redundancy, as you can imagine, and uh, one of the things that we found was, was a wonderful solution was preemptively sort of rejuvenating parts of the system. So you, your user never perceives that, you're, that you've lost resources. Bec and now that you mention it, yes, we do that as well. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so I'd also actually like to say, uh, just at the end, um, we have been talking about AAA game development uh, here. You know, the, the, the big, the, the headline of what most people think when they actually say, uh, when you say video games. Uh, video games is actually the largest entertainment industry uh, in the world uh, by actually quite a large margin at this point. There are so, so many games out there, you know, from small ones in your browser, mobile, uh, independent developers are just one or two people, uh, up to teams of thousands of people like what we've got, which covers just a huge span of uh, potential audiences of all ages, uh, genders, and races. Um, I'm sorry that you have not found uh, video <laughs> games fun, but I, I think... <laughs> okay. Uh, we, we should... Yep. It's, it's, it's not restricted to one gender or you know, one age or one demographic anymore. It is a massive industry that covers everyone. And I hope that one day if you decide to uh, look for a video game for you, Thank you. you will find something. Okay. <laughs> we, we have many people who want to pose questions, so please keep your questions as short as possible, and then we can maybe yeah. fit one or more in there before uh, the coffee. And uh, yeah, just, I'm sorry that the presentation went on a bit long, but uh, at the very least myself and probably Magnus will be outside for a while afterwards yes. if anyone has any additional but questions. John. Awesome, awesome talk, um, by the way. W one of the biggest problems that we struggle with is managing in an automated way machines that had never been intended to be managed that way. Um, for us, it's Apple Macs. The, trying to put them in a lab has been a horrible problem. Uh, having Xboxes and Playstations that are consumer devices sitting in a lab on wire racks. Uh, what kind of challenges are you facing managing those machines and what kind of solutions do you have for that? You are completely correct. Um, so yeah, the, the kits we have are actually not retail devices, they're uh, specific uh, development ones, but that doesn't really change the fact that they're not as stable as we would like for that, um, or at least you know, they have a habit of getting into a scenario. Uh, getting into an unrecoverable scenario. So what we'll do in most cases is before it runs any test, we'll run a health check uh, on the kit, which is just you know, really, really simple. Can you connect? Can you run a small known executable that outputs a state like, you know, does it have enough uh, hard disk space to actually take the build you're allowed to give it? If it doesn't, then we'll immediately remove that from the pool and do whatever we can to uh, get it back into a healthy state, which in most cases will actually just be a power cycle. Um, so, yeah, proactively checking it like that, but also building in enough redundancy that um, we never actually get into a state where we don't have enough hardware to be able to uh, test things uh, at such a great length. We're also working very, very closely with the uh, first parties, so that's most notably Microsoft and Sony, uh, to make the uh, software control in the kits a lot more robust so that we don't have <laughs> these problems. They're actually very, very uh, eager to work with us for this because it's uh, you know, a thing that is growing within the industry and there's a vested interest in making sure that the experience on that platform is the best. So uh, two-way street, but you know, largely very, very good monitoring. Okay, well. <laughs> I think we'll go with you. So this is very, uh, quite interesting, and um, uh, you've obviously invested a lot of energy and creativity into test as well as uh, gaming. I was curious, uh, what kinds of problems or bugs or failures have been most surprising to you uh, from the field? Goodness. Yeah, that's an interesting question. So, I'd say it's, yeah, I mean, we find, you know, typical asserts, typical crashes, you know, most of these things that are known. I'd say the really, really interesting bugs that we find are ones that are related to uh, non-determinism uh, of the engine, or at least a difficult determinism when running on different hardware specs. 
Um, with the way the game logic works, it's uh, quite susceptible, or it can be susceptible to race conditions depending on how things uh, are interacted. So you can end up in uh, you know, some really, really crazy states where like, the game will think a person is through the door, but the door's never open, so it's never actually triggered a, a, an end condition. Or, you know, someone's tried to be really, really clever with uh, the events that have been attached to an object, and something's been triggered completely out of scope from something else. Uh, a good example of this being a game I saw years and years ago, where it's, it's a big, multi-epic, you know, dozens of hours, uh, large world role-playing game, where, you know, the ultimate thing is you need to kill this big evil wizard. The thing is, right at the beginning of the game, you see this big evil wizard. Now, he's supposed to be invulnerable. And he is invulnerable to you, but he's not invulnerable to the villagers. So if you cause the um, villagers to get aggressive on the wizard, they would kill him in the first 30 seconds, and then you'd immediately win the game because <laughs> someone was clever and had put the end game trigger on the wizard. Those are the really interesting bugs that we see, and they're actually sometimes difficult to unpick, which is why we start, we're starting to try and put videos on the test cases so we can actually see why they fail. And those are generally the most interesting ones that we find. I can add that uh, some of the most entertaining bugs are bugs in the physics system um, because they make you fly into space when you take a step or in the animation system. We actually had that in Battlefield where all the soldiers became giraffes with 10 meter necks uh, because of a bug in there. So, uh, so, so I've been asked to keep this very short. Is it yes or no? Have you looked at using chaos engineering and testing to find the kind of situations you're talking about? Uh, yeah, so in a previous life, I actually built some of these systems, and uh, we, we used um, the most basic version of Chaos Monkey, I think. We never went into the gorillas or, uh, I mean, taking down data centers and other things. I'm not sure it's still used. It's been a couple of years since I was in that department. But, yeah, we, we've looked into it um, to, to test the robustness and redundancy of the backend systems to actually kill stuff uh, on a regular basis. Uh, I know you said yes or no, but when I mentioned earlier, break mm. the beta, that's the sort of thing that we'll yeah. do. Massive uh, takedowns of backends and things mm. like that to find out what's going on. Okay. We want to continue, but we cannot. We now only have 10 Sorry. minutes for the coffee break. So thank you very much again. Thank you.